Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, we, we until very recently hosted a podcast for WNYC, and today we're going to be talking to other people who are doing independent, semi-independent podcasting, uh, maybe similar to what you would hear on public radio, but hopefully different, right? Yeah, that's okay. good. So we're going to introduce them. Uh, without further ado, uh, the Song Exploder, or the host of the Song Exploder, Rishikesh Herwe, and uh, the hosts of Pitch... Alex Kappelman, and Whitney Jones. So how did I do pronouncing your name? Very good. Thank you, thank you. You undermined yourself. Uh, so yeah, we're all, just to contextualize this, I think we're all like sort of fans of, what, of each other's work who have basically never met. Uh, so we're genuinely interested in figuring some of this stuff out, but I also want to make sure we like explain stuff for people who are just like, I'm just tr I came here to buy an iPod. Why are you talking? Um, so yeah, Alex and I do a show that's about internet culture that tells stories about life on the internet. Do you want to explain your podcast? Sure. Um, song Exploder is um, it's where musicians come and they take a song of theirs apart so you can hear just parts of the song, just the drums or just the guitars or just the vocals, and they talk about how each of those pieces were made. Um, and then at the end, we listen to the whole song and it sort of reveals a new way of hearing the song after you've heard the component parts. Uh, and Pitch is uh, like a documentary music podcast. It's kind of like 99% uh, Invisible or This American Life or like Serial. Not really, it's actually not like Serial at all. But it's like a uh, documentary show, but for music, exploring like music culture and um, kind of the music that's around us um, every day. Yeah. So a question I kind of have for all you guys that I've been thinking about, I've been like listening to a lot of both your shows because we were doing this thing and because and they're good shows. And I feel like something that I would never want to do is interview a musician because they tend to be people who intentionally, I think like mystify their process. Like it's a lot of interviews where it's like, how do you do what you do? And they're like, I don't know, you know, it just comes to me. And, and it always feels like the interviewer musician relationship is like adversarial misunderstanding. And I think you guys, separately have found different ways around that. Um, I don't know, could you like both sort of talk about, like I think for yours, I think part of it is just like by making people talk about literally like how did you pick that drum ends up being a really fascinating question because you find out how someone's brain actually works in a way that I think musicians don't get asked. But like what, what kind of questions are you asking to make people actually talk to you in like a useful way? I, I mean, that's exactly right. Like I think that asking somebody why did you pick this drum sound for a song is uh, ends up getting much better results. I generally don't like music interviews or really, like, I, I hate music documentaries um, and most press about music I find pretty boring because, um, not necessarily on the, because of the fault of the interviewer, but, you know, musicians, the reason why you're interested in them is because of a very specific product that they make and... Um, just because they can write a good song or they can sing well or play an instrument well doesn't mean that they can speak well or tell a story in an interesting way. Um, and when I, when I go on tour as a musician, like I listen to a lot of podcasts, but they're always comedy podcasts because those are people who are interesting to listen to. You know, they can just riff. Um, there are a lot of musicians who think they're funny and think they're comedians, but, but aren't. And... Um, so I thought the only way to make something that would be interesting is to avoid sort of biographical discussion or, or sort of these larger macroscopic discussions about what inspires them and talk only about very specific data. So they have to address just the, the fundamentals of how they make the thing that you actually care about. And I mean, you guys, one end around you guys have is sometimes you're talking about people around music, but you also are talking to musicians. Like, how do you guys, how do you get around this problem? Yeah, I was going to say first, uh, we often talk to people around musicians. We talk to producers and we talk to uh, people on the promotion side. Uh, in one case, an actress who plays a musician in a particular role. And so that's, I mean, I mean I, often I find those people to be really interesting and people who aren't sort of in the spotlight necessarily a lot of the time. Um, when... I feel like when we do, I don't know if this is true for you, Axe, but when we do interview a musician for the show, 
it's uh, we go to them with a specific story already in mind. So we're not like, tell me about your most recent album and what you did on that. It's like, um, you chose to put a pause in this song. I'm doing a story that's greater than your song that you put that pause in, but I'd like to talk to you about what happened here and sort of help me put that in context to this greater thing. Actually, that I, I have a question for you guys too, and, and for you. So my background coming into this is, um, I mean, I, I have no background coming into this. I had never done a podcast before and had never worked in radio or anything like that. Um, so part of the reason why I, I in interview about these specifics about music is because that's the thing that I know how to talk about. Um, and it's what I'm curious about. But I don't also don't have any training as an interviewer. Did you guys, I think you guys are really fantastic interviewers. How, how did you guys get to that, get to learn that skill? Is that something that like comes naturally to you or is that something that you actually learned on the job or yeah, or for either of you guys? Uh, that's a great question. I think that, uh, I, I just have, I think it comes from obsessive podcast listening or radio listening. Um, just listening to, every time I've listened to an interview and agonized over what wasn't asked, that's like my teaching. That's the moment that teaches me. So like, and that happens to me all the time where it, an interview will end and I'll be like, oh, there was one very specific thing that you could have asked that could have taught me so much or would have taken, put all of this into context and uh, it's left out. And so for me, it's just listening to other people and sort of learning from them. And, you know, just kind of also making a lot of ma mistakes and doing a lot of terrible interviews that are unusable. Um, that's helpful too. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel like, I feel like I'm not, I feel really aware of how I'm a bad interviewer. Uh, like we spend, we edit ourselves, so you spend time just being like, why weren't you listening there? Why didn't you ask that question? Why did you ask that question in such a weird way that like doesn't really work? Um, I don't know, like it's a weird, you, you have to have part of your mind thinking like what you need to get and what the arc of the story is. And then you have to be really present so that you can notice something the way somebody says something or the way they don't say something. And like hopefully, I feel good about our stories when we get a moment in tape that we just didn't expect going in. Um, well, R R Rishi, I've noticed that you pretty much edit yourself out of your show <laughs> entirely. Yeah, I completely that, take myself out. And that's totally deliberate? Yeah, um, partly because I don't feel like I'm a great interviewer. And um, so it, it usually takes me a really long time to get to the answer that I want, I might have to ask three different times, three different ways, if I'm trying to get like, um, not necessarily something specific, because I don't know what the answer is, but it, a lot of times it's hard to get past the um, technical part of a song and get into the more interesting sort of like creative process or emotional attachment. Um, and I've, I've found that the best episodes tend to have people are talking about their feelings more than they're talking about um, a guitar sound or something like that. So I'll have to circle back a lot. And so I cut their answers up t to make one coherent answer to, t to go with a particular section. And usually in the, pro and in the process of that, I don't feel like there's any need for my question. Also, I don't feel like I'm an eloquent enough interviewer to justify taking up that, you know, whatever 30 seconds, one minute of me talking. Um, and I also just wanted the show to feel like it was a first person, like I wanted it to feel like it was about primary sources, that you were having this sort of um, unmediated experience instead of having sort of someone sort of editorially say, this is a great song and, and we're critics, we're talking about the song, this is why it's good, and having it feel like it's sort of somebody imposing a subjective idea onto you. This is just a musician saying, I made this song, this is how I made it, this is why I made it, this is the decision that I made about this very microscopic thing that normally you might not think about. And um, me being in there, I felt like would reduce that. Uh, Rishi, I don't, I don't know if you know how hard that is to do, like to, to interview someone and, and get them to say what they need to say in order to communicate a feeling or, or a piece of information that you need to get communicated. That's like really hard to do when, when you're not narrating yourself. So it, it's funny that like you default to that and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to interview, but like that's probably the hardest. It's, it's like really hard. I've tried to do it before and like suck at it. There's a reason why we don't do it. <laughs> I mean, aside from just, 
that's not been the style of the show, but it's not, it is something we've tried once or twice and had a not great success rate with. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, like, I think for most podcasts, radio, whatever, that comes out sounding not like people talking for three hours and riffing, but, like, sounds narrative. I mean, I interned at This American Life a million years ago. They would get eight hours of tape for what would be six minutes of radio. They would have somebody tell a story three, four, five different times, ask them what it meant seven different ways, and you just cut what doesn't work. And you kind of get, as long as you're not distorting what the person said, you, you get their best version of it. You get like the detail that they forgot the third time, but they got the fourth time. Sometimes it can feel like a police interrogation where you're just like wearing, everyone is wearing everybody down. Wait, so do you guys do that? Do you have people tell a story more than once? Yeah. Yes. The same story? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I Welcome typically to podcasting, don't. buddy. <laughs> I don't. I just try to get it on the first time. And if, if I don't get it, I just end up writing a lot of narration around it. Um, but also, I'm a terrible interviewer, so don't take my advice on that. Yeah, I, that's, that's, I mean, I love writing. Like, when you're writing a script, like, like I think there's, like, a, a lot of power and magic in that, in, in, like, being able to have a quote and be like, okay, well, they didn't say this, but I need to communicate this. And like, I also need to go from the last quote that they just said. Um, and I, I don't know, like, I, 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 just, I just really love doing it. And I think there's the, like, that's a whole separate skill. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Roman Mars from 99% Invisible called that writing with other people's words, which I thought is really interesting. I guess like my form, the format of Song Exploder doesn't allow for that, but. Um, but that seems like, to me, that seems like it would be harder. What you're that's, doing. that's really funny. So I was really curious with, with you guys, with the pitch crew. Um, it, I mean, your mandate's really broad. It's not just about songs or about artists. Uh, you did an episode not too long ago, which was just about the music you hear in the world or the sounds you hear in the world that end up sounding like, uh, that end up reminding you of music. And I'm, I mean, I was just wondering, like, what makes a pitch story? How do you know, how do you know, like, I feel like maybe it's hard to explain, but I'm curious, like, what it is that rises to the level for you guys that makes you want to pursue it. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I, I struggled explaining the podcast just now is because we don't, we're, we're still working through stuff. Like, we're, we're, we've only had 10 episodes so far, so, we're, so part of that is just trying to find something. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, the other hand is we do we do want to have a wide mandate. Like basically, we're like you know, we started off by saying like we're a show about music, and so we can do essentially whatever we want. Um, and I think I think that's really nice for me because like one you know we can do a show about like the history of how uh, uh, CD long boxes from like the '90s, the early '90s, and it was late '80s also maybe. Um, how they how they changed like politics forever and by I love that episode by the way this guy so good um and then you know we can do a, another one about like i don't know the iphone text tone like you were mentioning um so i i think yeah i think that was deliberate in to keep it wide but also because we just didn't really know what we were doing at first i don't know yeah i mean i, I think both of us have a lot of are broadly interested in a lot of different things. And I think music is broad enough a category that you can find sort of what am I interested in this week? What am I interested in this month? And then sort of go do a story on it. What about just like, how do you guys like, what part of your week are you making this in? How are you finding like time and resources to do it? Cause like you guys all put out shows on a regular schedule um, and, and do other stuff like to make sure that your rent is paid and you're eating and those sorts of things. Like, how do you make it work? Yeah, um, out, it's nice working with somebody because we, we put out a, sh a new episode every two weeks, uh, but we alternate, and so I am responsible for one a month, and Alex is responsible for one a month. And it's, uh, I work a full-time job, Alex freelances. Uh, it's nights and weekends, basically, which is hard, and I don't sleep as much as I probably should, but. Are, are your guys' episodes individually completely um, produced by just one of you or do you tend to collaborate a little bit you know like it's 90% one person and 10% the other or is it 100% and 
uh, the, I guess the way we describe it is like we, uh, yeah, I guess it's pretty much mostly uh, independently produced, and then we talk to other people for editorial help. So like, I mean, I tend to rely very heavily on Whitney for editorial help. Um, he's a great editor, um, and you know, vice versa. But we we also talk a lot about the stories as we're developing them, like we'll call throughout the week, we'll meet up for lunch a couple times a month and just be like, this is what I'm thinking. And then Alex will say, that's a terrible idea, don't do that. And I'll say, okay, I'll do this instead. And uh, so we're, we're sort of bouncing ideas back and forth as we go along, but the actual production, like each one of us reports the entire story by ourselves mostly. And then uh, we send a script to the other person uh, they go through the script, say, this makes sense, this doesn't, this doesn't really follow from what you're talking about over here. And then, like, they, we put it together individually and basically produce it that way. I, I actually, so we, we used to be more, um, more collaborative, but uh, because Whitney lives, like, an hour plus away from me, like, it just kind of, just out of just me being lazy, and also, honestly, like, listening to you guys and being, like, how do they like it seems so cohesive like you guys seem like you do kind of the same thing or like you ship or at least there's one voice right like pj you'll have one episode where you're the narrator and you're reporting and alex you'll do the same so i'm actually interested in seeing how much you guys have how, how much you guys collaborate in production uh it's terribly symbiotic we can't work we cannot complete an episode without one another and it's probably the saddest aspect of my life. Yeah, it's super gross. Uh, it's like a lot of texting. It's a lot of G-chatting. It's a lot of like uh, emotional... Manipulation, uh, bullying. So I was going to say support. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, we will write drafts uh, and we'll do four or five drafts where we edit each other. And um, PJ's a really brutal editor, man. It's really tough. Uh, and uh, I'm a really great, kind, forgiving editor. And um, can, no, can we, we get an example of, of something? Like PJ? I, just, I kill a lot of stuff. And I, I, I feel like the person you should be when you're editing is like a person who's not charmed by anything, who doesn't think the person they're working with is very funny or very interesting. Like you should be the most skeptical. So you're just like you always are. Yeah. Like you're easily confused and mad and like. You know, like you're at least self-indulgent. Like when you're writing, you should be, you should be like taken away with your own ideas, and you should love it. And then you should come back and be like, "This is this is really stupid." Um, I don't know. Uh, but I would say, I mean, they're they're not fifty-fifty. Certainly, it's like one of us goes out and does the interviews. But like even when we're doing the interviews, the other person is g-chatting questions to them. So like, there's no, we're we're complete. Our our process is hopelessly dependent on one another. It's not. Not healthy. It's codependent. How did you guys even decide to start working together? Because the thing that's interesting to me about TLDR is how, yeah, like you said, how cohesive the the voice is. It doesn't feel like two separate um, two separate idioms. You know, like I, like when did I love when you guys are talking about each other at the end about calling each other history's greatest monster, and you should not follow him on Twitter. You should follow me. Like, did that develop? naturally or is that something that you guys had to plan to figure out okay this is going to be the voice of the show this is going to be the sense of humor i definitely it was not <laughs> we worked together for uh almost five years on on the media and like being a staff producer on a show can be you can play a lot of backup for each other um alex like really helped me a lot i think i helped him and we have like a very close uh, sort of adversarial sibling type friendship and it felt like if you make the voice of the show as close as it is to the actual voice that you have it's, that seems like a lot easier to maintain I guess you know uh, what, what, whatever you hear like the the adversarial relationship that we portray on the radio is like a fifth or sixth of what it is in real life it's much worse um, PJ actually pointed me in the direction of some very early emails we sent to one another before we were actually friends not too long ago. And it was like, here are the clips you requested, sir. I hope you enjoy them. I hope to see you at work tomorrow. We and had that, deeper voices then. And then, <laughs> and that, but like now it's like we speak uh, a sort of inside joke language that uh, I think if we're at our best, at our like very best, 
comes through in our interactions on the radio. Could you uh, explain, since I don't have a background in radio, what it means that you guys were staff producers, what oh, you actually yeah. did, and how that translated to making your own podcast? Right. So uh, producer is this super elastic term in radio, depending on what show you work at. It can mean that you are just scheduling somebody else's interviews. It can mean that you are doing background research or pre-interviewing people. Um, it can mean that you're a reporter on a show that has a host. On the media, where we worked was like a weekly news show where our job was to both like sometimes report stories, a lot of like researching and editing other people's interviews. Um, and our station, WNYC, at one point a year and a half ago? Uh, Two years ago? It was 2013. It was like spring of 2013. They did a contest where they said that anybody in the station, whatever you did, they wanted people to pitch shows. And we knew that we liked working together. Um, and we both like, I mean, we both like, like the internet. It's weird. Like, I don't feel like I have a abiding love of it that goes at least as far back as like, even like the way you guys will talk about music. Like, it feels like you kind of stake a flag and then you're covering it. And then you do, you know. Um, but yeah, so we did it as sort of a side project at WNYC for a bit. And then it got some audience. And so we were able to like work on it with more of our time. Uh, yeah. So you still had to do your regular full-time job? For a while, we had to do our regular full-time jobs, and then we got sort of, we were given the freedom to kind of do our own show full-time for about eight months, maybe? Yeah. It was great. I mean, it's, we're in a really weird moment for podcasts where you're still sort of allowed to try this stuff, and everybody believes in it, and everybody thinks these things are going to work, but like, no one would give you the amount of freedom to just like make a radio show the way people will give you the amount of freedom to make a podcast. But a podcast is just as likely to, make, to like reach as big an audience um, and as devoted an audience. So we were lucky. Like we were lucky that we were allowed to mess around with it, and that also like we got support for it once it started to work. And then and then you left, and, <laughs> and then we left, <laughs> and then we were like, let's throw this all away. Yeah. So uh, what's what's next? What's on the horizon? Uh, we, we've been instructed by our bosses to be coy about this. Here's what we can tell you. They said, they said be coy. Like, say, say be coy about say, this. Say, be verbatim. coy about this. Here's what we can tell you. The answers are in the credits of other podcasts and in our Twitter mentions. So if you guys want to do a little digging, it's not hard to figure it out. Yeah, nobody who cares doesn't know. Or uh, if you but just mostly wanna, don't care. If you just want to come up to us afterward and ask us, we'll probably just tell you. Yeah. Oh, that's really all you can say? That's yeah, really, that's yeah. really it. I you think. can't say the name of the... I don't think so. New... I don't think we can. Podcast company that... Don't look... Look, this is on you if you all decide right. to do this. Uh, no, we can't. We can't. Uh, we, could, we could confirm or deny something. Or wait, we could no comment something. <laughs> Are you... you glow so something? you left On The Media. Yes. And WNYC. Yes. yes. On The Media is a production of WNYC? Yeah. Yes. It's, a, it's distributed by NPR and produced by WNYC. And you're no longer working with either of those entities. You're that is correct. With a new entity. Yeah, with a new entity. And people don't know this entity, or they do know it. They might know it. They might know it because people have been talking about it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> guys, you guys, you guys are so coy right now. Uh, uh, is it a for a company that's named after a drink? Let's, <laughs> let's not let's not grill <laughs> no these guys comment. let's okay. not grill these guys but i would say more generally like that is the other nice thing about right now is like there are people that are looking for like talent right now and like the amount of resources you need to make a podcast are like uh basically a thousand dollars to buy the equipment yeah and no then, it can be cheaper than that well and actually then seven dollars yeah. for a libsyn account and then you can make your own podcast um the real challenge and where all the resources go is making something that's not, you know, two people in a room for two and a half hours recounting the events of the past week, which there's a, a lot of. Yeah. Right. But yeah, and, and also like now I have more friends, like my, like my really good friends who are like, oh my God, have you heard Serial? Like with Serial being out there and like, it's kind of like the first podcast to be part of the zeitgeist. You know what I mean? The first type of show like this that's like real. Like this American Life is big, but like I, 
I feel like cereal is like really it's happening now and like people are talking about it, at least amongst like my friends and stuff. Um, and I feel like now is really the time to start like, I don't know, like if you're worried about leaving your public radio job at like a huge station for a podcast company that maybe people know or not, you know, that might f fail or succeed. Like, I think this is the time to really do it because it's, it's, things are percolating. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I like my friends who listen to say like this American life and radio lab would always say like, well, what are the other podcasts listen to? And I think like this is the year where like everyone's making those podcasts. Like they kind of didn't exist at the same extent before or the past couple of years. Yeah. yeah. And this is not to denigrate the shows where people just chat for two and a half hours. Some of those are great. Yeah, uh, I those are mostly what you listen to. I listen to a lot of that. So, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Rishi a question about Song Exploder, which is, um, are you? My dream would be to like be to be able to pick the songs that I could have exploded. Do you? <laughs> Do you do you choose, go approach artists with a specific song in mind, or do you approach an artist and say, "Is there a song you would like to do with this?" Or do they say to you, "Like I will only do this on the condition that we do this particular song"? Like, how does that get chosen? Yeah, it happens all of the ways that you described. It just depends. So there's some. If I feel like I have a relationship with them, I might be able to say, "I really love this song. I think it would be a perfect song for the show." Um, sometimes they come back and they'll say, no, not that song. How about this other song? And um, yeah, sometimes it's completely not up to me. Uh, are you mostly picking from music that you like? Are you consciously trying to sort of go outside of your comfort zone and go after artists that you're not as familiar with or not like as big a fan of? Or like what is the selection process or the process of your lineup because I can imagine that you probably you get a hundred emails a day which are like you need to do X next I I do get emails sometimes from people who are like oh you should have this band on your show or this person on your show but they're just and I'm like oh great can you introduce me <laughs> and they can't so um, I think the uh, for trying to pick the, sh the songs I'm trying, I try to expand it beyond what I normally listen to, like be, beyond my listening taste. But at the same time, um, all the songs, I have to like the song because I spent so much time working on it that if it were a song that I didn't like at all, it wouldn't be fun to make. So um, it's beyond the genres that I listen to the most, but it's all, all, every song that's been on the show so far is something that I like. After... Uh after you're done with an episode, can you like never listen to that song again? No, all I want to do is listen to that episode, that song. Then, actually, like I'll get the song stuck in my head, and you know, the show is about trying to give this sort of intimate relationship to a listener about a, a song, but they don't get to hear. I mean, I'm, I leave stuff on the on the floor. A lot of the stuff doesn't make it into the show. So, I part of the show. I'm, I'm making it definitely for selfish reasons, being able to find out more, and I get to have the most intimate relationship with the song outside of the person who, who's making it because I'm, I'm hearing all of those parts and all of those stories. So after it's done, I usually, the, like, I listen to all of those songs now, probably more than I would have otherwise. Well, that's the brilliance of the podcast. Like, I, I listened to the one, um, uh, the one that, that was breaking down the um, theme for the John Oliver uh, show uh, for Last Week Tonight. And like I had, uh, you know, I, I love that show, and I listened to the to the intro every time, and I was like, "Yes, eh, this isn't really a great intro. I wish they picked something differently." And then I listened to the sh to the show, and like literally, when I saw you today, I was like, "Okay, Rishi, Song Exploder," and then I just started thinking of the episode, and now I have that song stuck in my head, and I've had it in my head for the past, you know, hour, and it's re I really like it. Like I've listened to it like ten or fifteen times since I heard the episode. It's just it's really good, and I think you've done a really good job like doing that so now when you listen to the tv show you, your feelings about the theme the intro will change you think yeah i want to i want them to keep going and listen <laughs> i want to listen through the whole song that's awesome yeah uh so we're gonna open the floor to questions if anybody wants to ask a question of anybody on the panel new york magazine called today uh the sort of renaissance of podcasts and how they're consolidating, a lot of companies are sort of consolidating and picking up a lot of talent. And so I'm curious what you guys think the next, 
I don't know, let's call it five years of podcasts are going to uh, be like, like the, the industry or, or the tools or um, how, how do you think it's, it's going to evolve to become more popular? Uh, the next five years? That's a great question. It could be a situation where it becomes like a, a market, like an amazing, incredible place to, and everyone's a huge success and we're all millionaires. Uh, it could be a situation where like the people who are doing it for the love of the game and are not really making a lot of profit, they kind of uh, disappear and it becomes a smaller market. It's like really hard to say what the next five years are going to be. Um, I think that this renaissance has been here for a while and it, it sounds like you're a pretty hardcore podcast fan, so you probably have no, known that this renaissance has been here for a minute. And it's just that I think the, the sort of people who didn't listen to this stuff are starting to pick up on it too. It's like uh, all the people who were using Netflix Instant before, uh, before House of Cards. And now, and, and Serial is the House of Cards of podcasts. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. I think a lot of money is coming in. I think people are feeling risky. And I think it'll be a really good few years where people, a lot of people are going to get chances. Um, I'm really excited to see what people do. I mean, I think people have done so much with so little for so long. And there's, there's like such a wealth of good stuff already that I think it's going to be really good. I also think that like it's just getting easier to make a podcast. It's easier to make a good podcast. Um, it's so cheap now. And it's so... It's so it, there's so many good examples that it's becoming easier to make a thing that is a very high quality. Actually, I was going to ask you guys. So... How did you um, get your show off the ground? It's sort of related to that in terms of like, how did, how did you make it legitimate? Because I think of it as a legitimate podcast, which is, you know, there are a lot of podcasts out there and not all of them feel legitimate. Like, did you have to, did you have to pitch your show? No, we just made it and put it out there. And uh, uh, it's, it's, I, I, it's nice to to hear from you that it feels legitimate because for us it's just like something that we make and uh, it's we and we put it out there, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, last year about this time we met Alex and I met in a bar, just like it's not there anymore, but it was just down the street here, and uh, the ladies, we you guys just are came up with this idea and started making stories and putting them out. Uh, to this day, like we don't have, we're not on a network, we don't have any sponsors uh we don't have any underwriting if anybody wants to underwrite our show like come up and talk to me afterwards we can talk about it but uh we, we make this basically like out of our out of our apartments and uh like you said the the, the tools are there like i come from a background in public radio alex is in public radio so like we we do this stuff for other people and it's just a matter of like making stories for ourselves and putting it out. And with the internet, it's so easy to send things around and catch people's attention. Uh, we, we pitched our show out to episodes of it to other programs. We had an episode on 99% Invisible. Uh, we've, got, we've gotten a few mentions in a couple of different places. Uh, there was an NPR podcast that gave us a nice bump. Uh, we were on BuzzFeed a couple weeks ago, and that gave us a nice bump. And so it was just a matter of like making people aware of it, I guess, and then it sort of takes on a life of its own from there, I think. That's the thing, actually, just a quick side note. With, with one of the reasons why Serial, I think, is doing so well, aside from the fact that it's amazing and it's being backed by This American Life, um, is that they hired, like, a real PR company, like, like, a, like, like a band would do. Um, and, you know, they, like, that PR company got them lots of placements, like Rolling Stone, like New York Magazine, like you were saying, like, lots of places. Um, and so, um, uh, I, I guess, I guess, m I, I think that's kind of an ignored part. Like a lot of like public radio people, like you were saying, do it for the love of the game, um, and kind of ignore. It's like a lot of musicians. Like a lot of musicians, are like if I just make my music, people will come. But that's not necessarily true, especially when you're independent. So that's something that I had thought a lot about coming from a, an independent music background, like doing a lot of PR myself and stuff like that. That's something that um, me and Whitney had talked extensively about, and um, like obviously, number one priority is make good stuff, but you know you also need to take some time and like we. I spend so much time doing like social media and like sending emails to people. Like it's as I'm sure you probably do with your band, Rishi. Um, and 
it's I mean that's an important that's a really important part of it too that I think a lot of people ignore and that could benefit from that I have a question for Rishikesh um, I, the conventional wisdom about radio is that in order to, for something to be engrossing it needs to have like narrative uh, or emotion um, and Song Exploder, we were talking earlier, it's not like completely devoid of narrative or emotion. It's, it's like, you know, I made a song and I recorded it this way, but it seems like a much less important part of making it engrossing. And I'm curious what you, like how you think of structuring it in a way that um, will still, will keep people listening, even though there's not a like, what's gonna come next uh, in the same way that there is in like a This American Life formatted story. Uh, I think a big part of that is keeping the episodes really short. So, you know, some people who like the show have asked for um, episodes to be longer or have asked why they aren't longer, and that's mainly the reason, because I, I don't know, I don't think that it would really sustain, because there is no narrative. But I do try and structure it in terms of um, having, just to the extent of, like, the opening and the ending of the show should have some kind of, this is something that I, I was told by Jesse Thorne who runs Maximum Fun, which is the podcast network that, um, that Song Exploder is on. And, you know, he's somebody who's done public radio and podcasting for a, a long time. So I took his advice very seriously. But he sort of set a, a good general rule, and I follow this for every episode, is have feelings at the beginning, have feelings at the end. And, um, and I think if I can find that, that's the hardest part for me, you know, with the interviews is finding those moments. But once I have that, then I can try and sort of build some kind of um, mini thesis around, you know, what, what the song is about, like what the story of the making of the song is. But even if I can't, it's like, okay, the beginning, this is why the song is important. And at the end, this is why it's still important. Or this is what I, you know, these are my feelings on this part. So if, if I can capture those, then it feels like I got it. And if not, I don't know. I still don't really know what I'm doing. This question is also for Rishi. Um, I listen to all your guys' shows a lot. I love them. Um, but one thing that's different about yours is I can't picture you making it. Like, do you have an open Pro Tools session with the artist? Are you pointing to track? Like, how do you actually physically make your show? Um, it, again, I make it, th like, one of three different ways. Um, either they come over to my... Uh, like where I have my setup, which is just in my place, like where I make music, it's, there's a computer and a desk, and I'll set up a microphone, and, um, and yeah, and I'll literally, you know, we'll, we'll have the Pro Tools session up on one computer, and then I have another computer that's running, you know, like I'll have uh, another computer that I just record their side of the interview in, and we'll go through and I'll say, okay, what's happening here? what's the sound, or, you know, and I'll get the stems beforehand so I know the stuff that I find interesting or stuff that sounds crazy that I want to talk to them about. The other way is I'll do it um, where I'll, I'll go to their studio and the same thing, I just take, take a little portable setup. And then the third way, and the way that it's been happening a lot recently is I do it over the phone where they send me the stems and I check it out and then call them and they have the stems up and I'll sort of know in advance what I want to talk to about. It takes a lot from them because they have to also then run the, the stems on their, song, their side, but then also record themselves and then send me the audio file afterwards. And then after the interview's done, I just um, you know, sit for hours and try and piece the whole thing together. Do you, have you guys figured out what your next show is gonna be? Like, you know, in terms of just a log line even? Uh, imagine the log line for TLDR and then just say it to yourself in your head and it's the exact same thing. Are you not allowed to say no, the no, show no, about the internet? It's it's about the it's about the internet. It's going to be about the internet. It'll be different. I think. I think we're gonna. I mean, okay, we did thirty eight episodes of our last show, which seems like a lot, but like we still don't feel like we're quite. Like we're still developing. I I think if hopefully we'll always continue to develop and like refine what we're making. Um, so we're still trying to work out exactly what our new show is going to sound like, but it's going to sound familiar to the people who liked our old show, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the same thing, basically. Yeah. But you haven't started actually recording yet? No, no we, we have. have. Oh, okay. It feels yeah. great. Do you have a launch date? Soon. Soon. 
like weeks, not months. Next is what month. what we're saying. I'm going to say next month. Oh, don't say next month. Uh, soon. All right. Soon. Maybe not next month. So I'll look for it on November 14th. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Th- thank you, everybody, for coming. We yeah, really appreciate so it. Thanks, everyone.